Please stand, and please remain standing as our Sheriff's Office Color Guard presents the colors, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. The pledge is going to be led by Dan Mulvey. He's a retired sergeant and founder of the Danny Mulvey Foundation in honor of his son who passed away four years ago this month at the age of 20. The pledge will be followed by the members of the worship team of Grace Community Church, leading us in our national anthem. Good morning, good morning. My name is Larry Dower. I'm a medical physicist at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And my beautiful, loving wife and I live in Newburgh. 
I have a question for you. Oh my, haven't the past almost two years been times where prayers were so urgently required? It's a good thing we were prayed up. As we gather together once again, we can boldly proclaim with the psalmist, behold, how good and pleasant it is when sisters and brothers gather together in unity to bless the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. I welcome and encourage you all to enjoy this blessed morning in the company of sisters and brothers. Today's prayer breakfast is patterned after, loosely after the national prayer breakfast, and that's explained in detail in the programs that you have at your seats. We are very glad and grateful that, you have, that so many county residents have come to join us of all faiths have come together this morning. By the way, this is the biggest group ever for the prayer breakfast in Orange County. It's also the biggest group ever for this brand new facility, so a little grace is awesome and they've been doing fantastic, an amazing job. So thank you very much to our hosts. Remember this morning that our express aim, our aim, our purpose is to gather and pray for all leaders of the county. So who are the leaders of the county? This includes government, business leaders, nonprofits, educational leaders, medical, first responders, military and law enforcement, and other leaders. A hearty and healthy thank you to all of our sponsors. That's all of you. This breakfast would not be possible without you. Sponsor names are listed on the cards on the tables and on the banners that, as you came in this morning. A special thanks to Goodwill Church for uh, providing those uh, banners for us. Thank you very much. In addition to table sponsors, this year we have several generous donors who have also contributed toward the prayer breakfast, and we thank all of them as well for being such a supportive part of this event very integral. Please see the program about others who have helped made this event and uh, a morning very special. We'd like to pause now to acknowledge the political leaders that have joined us this morning. We thank you for joining us. We acknowledge the military personnel. We thank you for joining us. We especially thank our first responders. Thank you for joining us. We also thank the prayer breakfast committees, uh, members from both Orange County, without which this event definitely would not happen. So give them a huge round of applause. We also received support from the surrounding counties at Prayer Breakfast, and they're here as well, so we thank them. We are so glad that you are here, and we thank you as well. We also acknowledge and thank all of our health care workers and frontline staff for their incredible hard work and dedication to the health and safety of our county residents during this trying pandemic. So give them a gigantic Now I have a special acknowledgement. Uh, anyone wearing a bow tie? Raise your hand. Anyone wearing a bow tie? Thank you for trying to bring style back to the county. Thank you. Okay, seriously. Now, let's begin with an opening prayer. Our opening prayer this morning will be delivered by Heinrich Barth. Heinrich is a member of the Bellevale Bruderhof community at Chester. He and his wife Irene have been married for 32 years. They have five children and two granddaughters. In June 2019, Heinrich suffered a traumatic brain injury. It was caused by a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. Despite a less than 1% chance of survival, he is here with us today. And he attributes that to the amazing healthcare workers at Garnet Health and the incredible power of prayer. Heinrich is hoping to join the chaplain program at Garnet. He wants to give back to the dedicated staff who took such amazing care of him. Heinrich's injury has left him legally blind, and his faithful dog, Lincoln, who I met last night, 
accompanies him everywhere. Heinrich, podium is yours for the morning prayer. Good morning, friends. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Amen. And with these words from Psalm 118, let us bow our heads in prayer to our God. Lord, we thank you for this glorious morning. Thank you for the wonder of your creation from the mighty Hudson River to the majestic forest. We feel your great love in this place we call home. Thank you that we can be gathered in this place, asking for your guidance to navigate the challenges that each day brings. Be with everyone here this morning. We pray for our speakers, Lord, bless their message. Open our hearts to hear your word today. We uplift you, our county leaders, law enforcement officers, healthcare workers, business leaders, pastors and all who have volunteered their time to support the people of our county. Though challenges face us, you have shown that when we pull together, we are able to overcome every obstacle. Thank you, Lord. We are grateful, Lord, for the provision of breakfast this morning and ask your blessing on it. We pray for those who are ill in our county, knowing that you bring healing strength to uplift the weak the sick, and those who are broken. Help us to live by these words from Micah, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. May your words to King Solomon touch us today. If your people, called by your name, seek your face and return from our wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land. We praise you, Lord, for you alone are the almighty God and guide all things with your loving hand. Amen. 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 Josh is president and CEO of Focus Media Incorporated. It's a public relations and marketing firm that it began 20 years, 20 years ago? 22 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, Josh, of course, is known in the community as an astute and caring business leader who generously supports many nonprofits in Orange and Sullivan counties. In fact, he uh, helped us last night. Thank you very much. He is a past chair of the Community Foundation and the Sullivan County Partnership. Josh is married to his life and business partner, Lisa, and together they're raising their three children in a household that is a harmony of both Jewish and Christian faith. Josh says that he is humbled to participate in today's wonderful event. Please welcome Josh Summers. So is it great to be all in one room together after so long of uh, being apart, right? Well, I would like to, to thank the committee for asking me to participate. I have to admit, I was a little surprised they asked me, but uh, it, it, really, it really is you know, wonderful to be together. It's particularly wonderful that uh, there are people of all faiths in the room uh, and that we all can come together to talk about faith uh, during times that have been difficult. The last year and a half, we have all been tested from our way of life changing to many of us losing loved ones and friends. So it, it is absolutely wonderful that we can come together. My reading today is from the book of Joshua. It's about leadership during a trying time for the Israelites. Imagine following Moses after his death and then uh, talk about a tough act to follow. Joshua was commissioned by God to lead the Israelites through the, to the promised land. Joshua chapter one, verses five through nine, God spoke to Joshua. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall come cause the, uh, this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. 
Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is wherever you go. While it may be easy to lose faith during times of difficulty, just like Joshua, there are people that have stepped up for us to encourage us and to answer the call to lead. Thankfully, we have many that have done that, from our county executive and county government, to the doctors and nurses on the front lines, to the many essential workers that showed up to work to ensure that our medicines and our groceries were there for us, and so many more uh, that are not named. We thank all of you, keep the faith, and uh, thank you so much again for the chance to participate. Thank you very much, Josh. Did you hear that? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Amen. Next, Dr. Juan Goizeta will share a New Testament reading with us. Juan was born in La Paz, Bolivia. He now lives in Orange County with his wife, Valerie, of 38 years. They have four children and three grandchildren. He's currently a member and elder of Goshen Christian Reformed Church. Juan is Mount Sinai trained, nef trained nephrologist uh, with a private practice since 1998, and he's an attending nephrologist in Sullivan County. He mentors medical students from several medical schools, including Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine, our very own. Juan has been instrumental in developing Christ Healthcare Ministry, which supports free clinics in Goshen and Ferndale. His main objective in life is to live out his faith as a Christ follower in whatever he does before he goes home to be with the Lord. Please welcome Dr. Goizueta. Thank you, Larry. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dot, Mary Pat, and the rest of the committee for this invitation uh, to be a part of this year's uh, breakfast prayer breakfast. It is an honor to be up here um, to meet Illuminae, her, I mean, Immaculate, her family, uh, and uh, to have read the book, Left to Tell. Uh, I highly recommend it. You will be blessed. And I look forward to reading her other books. The one that I just downloaded, uh, Audible, is Led by Faith, so I'm looking forward to it. As I read the following passages, uh, would you meditate on them? So, from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. From the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus and his teaching in Matthew chapter 5, we read, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? The last passage is from the letters to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is God's word. Praying next for our county leaders today is Joan Cusack McGurk. Joan has served for over 40 years at St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital and was instrumental in finalizing the partnership between St. Luke's and the Montefiore Health System. 
She graduated as an RN from St. Vincent's Hospital, just like my aunt did a long time ago, and Medical Center in New York City. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from SUNY New Paltz. She earned her graduate degree at NYU, and she's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business Fellows Program. It's a wonder she had time to do anything else like raise children. Most recently, Joan has ably led St. Luke's through the COVID-19 pandemic, gigantic huzzah which she described as the proudest moment of her career. In her words, she witnessed bravery, heroism, and true dedication across the entire organization. Between Joan and her beloved late husband, John, they have seven children and 11 grandchildren, the highlights of her life. Please welcome Joan. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for the committee for inviting me to speak before you today. It's truly my honor. Today, as we finally gather together again, I ask everyone to join me in giving thanks for our dedicated county leaders, our county executive, Steve Newhouse, our Orange County legislators, our judges, our sheriff, Paul DeBoyce, our DA, Dave Hoover, and all our law enforcement, teachers, healthcare professionals, and all the business leaders and the community leaders that lead us throughout the county. Their demonstrated leadership gave us the strength to put one foot in front of the other day after day. Let us ask for a special blessing to our dear friend and county executive, Steve Newhouse. What he has taken us through in the last 19 months is nothing short of remarkable. His leadership is steadfast, unwavering, and has taken us some of the most challenging times Orange County has ever seen. Also at the same time, he protect our nation and our freedom. God bless you, Steve. Thank you. Today, as we pray for the continued physical, emotional, and spiritual protection of all of our county leaders and their families, we ask that we stay united and seek the continued grace, wisdom, and direction for our county. Today's keynote speaker, Emmanuel, is an incredible example for all of us. She found forgiveness and ultimate peace in one of the most horrific events the human mind and spirit could encounter. She did so with grace, she led with her heart, and allowed so many others to share in her journey. Immaculate's story is one that serves as an inspiration to all of us, definitely to me. That together with the power of forgiveness, we can overcome anything. <clears throat> God, bless. <clears throat> God bless our leaders, Immaculate, all my community friends and colleagues that are here today and those that have come before us. Thank you for the privilege of speaking to you all. Thank you, Joan, for sharing that prayer of blessing over us and for all of our county leaders. Next, we have the distinct honor and privilege to hear from our keynote speaker, Immaculate Ilabagiza. In 1994, Immaculate then was a college student. She survived the Rwandan genocide by hiding along with seven other Tutsi women in a very small bathroom in the home of a local pastor. After 91 days, Ilabagiza emerged to find that most of her family had been murdered. In 1998, she immigrated to the United States and has since written multiple books in which she shares her experiences and tells of the rediscovery of her faith and her refusal to succumb to anger and resentment. Immaculate's first book, Left to Tell, Discovering God Amidst the Rwandan Holocaust. It's been translated into 15 languages worldwide and has been made into a documentary, The Diary of Immaculate. She is regarded as one of the world's leading speakers on peace, faith, and forgiveness, and she shares her universal message with world dignitaries, school children, multinational corporations, churches, 
and thankfully with us here in Orange County. She also raises money for her Left to Tell charitable fund, which directs benefits to the children orphaned by the genocide. Just this week, Immaculate was in Rwanda, actually just a few days ago, it feels like yesterday, where she was given a very special award from the president of Rwanda himself that only a very select few have been honored with. Please welcome Immaculate Ilipikizia. Already killing people. 
In our country, before, whenever the president was changed, there was always troubles. So I knew something terrible was going to happen. I went outside with my brother. We met my parents. My dad was a director of Catholic schools. My mom was a teacher. And they were putting on the radio to hear what was going on in the country. I remember two hours later, BBC Radio reported 18 families that were killed. They were saying things like, 10 children and mom and dad have just been killed. Eight children and mom and dad have just been killed. And I remember my father saying, this never happened before, where they killed whole family. And that is really why they call it a genocide. It was an attempt and well organized to kill everyone of our tribe. By the second day, we had so many people coming home. My parents really, now I can say I'm grateful I met them. Because sometimes we take each other for granted. We take our loved ones for granted. And I think I did in some ways. So I told them we'd always be there. But they loved people. They practiced their Catholic faith, their Christian faith. The things they always did was to go to the neighbor who is sick, who is have a child who is not going back to school. You know, how they can help. And now the whole village came to us to ask my father what to do because they trusted them. The last image I remember of my father, I remember he had a rosary in his hand speaking to people who have run to him. And he was speaking to people from different faith, Protestant, Adventists, you know, Catholics, because tribes were not about religion. And then he said, if it is a matter of a small group that want to go to us, do not be scared. Fear is our worst enemy. Gather together, we will defeat them. And then he said, however, if it is a government that planned this, I cannot lie to you. They have the military, they have the police, they block the borders, they shut down every activity in the country, so they will kill us. And that was, I loved my dad. I was like, one girl among three boys. I was worried about him, like protecting him in some ways. I said, Dad, you don't tell people they're going to die. And then he said something really that did something to my faith. He said, even if it was a government, let's not be scared. Let's take this as a chance God is giving us to repent our sins so we can go to heaven. I'm like, are we supposed to be happy because we're going to die? But actually, everyone went quiet, and I did, and I was repenting, asking God to please forgive my sins for anything I have done, in case we are dying. After that, he came and gave me the rosary he had, and he asked me to go to Hawaii to a neighbor who was a Protestant pastor from the other tribe and who was a good man. As you can see, one another person was ready to realize that there's no such thing as bad people because they belong to a bad group of people, because they are from that tribe or that religion or that area, that country. It was a big lesson. My father had met that man, a friend, and he knew he, knew he was a good man. I went to the neighbor. I remember he put me in this tiny bathroom. And I was complaining, three by four feet. What am I going to do in this bathroom? Where do I sit? Where do I sleep? Well, as I was complaining, he brought five more women. <laughs> Later, he brought two more women. We became eight in three by four feet. He told us not to speak to one another, not to make any noise. He said he won't even tell his own children. So we started here. It was another big lesson. It really taught me, you know, complaining doesn't help. <laughs> and when you think things are bad, they can get worse. <laughs> not to scare you, but it really taught me to take every moment and value it. Because you just don't know what is tomorrow. Love now. Use the strength you have. We don't know what is tomorrow. So he left, I remember the first week, I had so many emotions, bad emotions. I had anger I can't put in words. My heart was racing out of anger. I had a headache. My blood would be running out of anger. My, I would be sweating out of anger. And then my stomach was aching out of fear. And then I would be impatient. I thought, I cannot stay one more hour. I'm going to die. So when he came to leave us food, I grabbed his food and I asked him, if he can put the radio outside so we can hear what was going on. He was kind, he put three different radios so we can, we can hear what was going on in the country. I 
couldn't believe it. The government ministers were on radio calling everyone to kill everyone from my tribe. One of them, I remember, said, don't forget children and don't forget elder people. We are cleansing and then we are going to live in a paradise. I'm like, what is happening with this person? Because this was a smart man who had a PhD. And yet, this is what he was saying. It was that time I started to turn to God, really realizing that people can change. This is, a man, this is a man who used to tell us to love each other, to be good citizens. Now he was changing. I remember they gave order to start killing everyone of the tribe, people who went to stadiums, to churches, and then they started to search everywhere in the country. They made small groups, three to four hundred people, village by village, to search and kill. One time they came to search for us. I thought it was the worst thing to be there for one week. I remember when they came to search, I saw them through the window of the bathroom. I thought it was a thousand people, but there were three to four hundred. They were dressed in banana leaves, they had all kinds of arms, long spears, machetes, and they started to search everywhere. This house was a four-bedroom house. There was nothing in my mind that can tell me I might survive. I thought I was going to die, and I knew I was going to die. I felt in my body like a thousand needles were going through my body. The pain to wait. They searched everywhere, and I remember feeling as if I heard voices over my shoulders. And what nothing too strange, the things we feel when we're facing a challenge. And one voice was telling me, open the door, end the torture. Why wait? That sounds like you, you know, being reasonable. You're right, four bedroom with three, four hundred people searching. They can't miss one door. Another nicer voice was telling me, do not open the door. Ask God to help you. Do you remember who God is? God is almighty. You know what almighty means? It means he can do anything. Do you know what anything means? Even if they shoot you, the bullet might not go through you. That's why I love God. Just to, I don't see how we can have hope if we don't have God. So in that moment, I really felt this is much nicer voice. I had to choose what voice to listen to. And I remember turning to the nicer voice and ask God, if there's anyone who created me, if there's anyone who put all this together, I beg you, don't let the killers find us today. And I remember I wanted a specific sign to make sure that God had God in my heart. I asked God, if you can hear me, don't let them open the door of the bathroom. If they don't do it, I will notice you who did it. And I promise you, I will never lose faith in you again. After I asked that, I fainted. It was until five hours later, the man who was hiding us, he came and opened the door and we jumped. I thought it was the killers who had found us. And it was him, and he told us what happened. He said there were three to four hundred people. A big number went around the house to make sure no one jumps out of the window. Another number went in every room, in the closets, under the beds, in the ceiling of the house, on the roof of the house, they searched everywhere here. They even opened suitcases to make sure there were no babies hiding. And then he said, at the end, they came right to the door of the bathroom. Before they opened, one of them said, you know what, we trust you. You are a good man. There's no way you can hide these bad people. And he turned around and he left. When the man told us that, it was the time I knew for sure God is real. And then it was a little bit shocking. I said, oh, so God can see me, he can hear me, and he can read my thoughts. That was really good, because we we're not allowed to speak, so now I can talk to him. I'm not alone. But then another part was a little scary. Oh, so he, if he can hear my thoughts when I don't talk. <laughs> that means he can see everything. <laughs> Even the things I don't want him to see. <laughs> then I remember started to talk to God as I'm talking to you. And I would tell him, well, I know you don't like me being angry, but you know what's going on. They tried to kill us. I thought God was understanding of my hate, but I thought what God was doing was, okay, start praying now. Now that you believe in me, start praying. What does the Bible tell us? Pray unceasingly. I said, yes, you're right. 
I asked the man to give me the Bible. I had the most dream my father had given me. I started to pray from morning until night. One thing especially I wanted to understand, to understand was, where do we go after this? And I felt like God was saying, there's a choice of heaven and a choice of hell. And it's up to you what you want to work for. I didn't want to look at hell because I was in hell right there. And I wanted to look at heaven. And I remember reading about heaven. I really encourage you to look at heaven, to understand, to read about it. Because it is hard to work for a reward if you don't know what it is about. And I remember reading in the Bible, the roads and diamond and gold. There's no more pain, no more getting older, no getting sick. It's perfect. How long? Forever and ever. And then I started to think, wait, maybe the life on earth is like a hundred years. But heaven is millions and zillions of years and it's much better. Who cares about this if this is so good? And I started to put things in perspective. Because life on earth becomes like a dot compared to eternity, like a blink in a lifetime compared to eternity. Then I said, okay, how do I get there? It all depends how we do things here. I remember going through the Bible and I saw the commandments of God and I'm like, I can do that until I started to read about forgiveness. I felt like every page in the Bible, like forgiveness was floating from the, the pages. I would open a page and I would say, uh, love your enemies. If you love, as we just heard, if you love only those who did good to you, what reward do you deserve? I'm like, oh no, close that page. Because I was so angry. I didn't know how you can forgive somebody trying to kill you. I would go to another page. Uh, pray for those who persecute you. I'm like, no, no, close that page. You don't know. My persecutors are really bad. I would go to another page. Forgive how many times? Seven, seventy times. How? How do you forgive? You can't even forgive once. I started to get worried that I might actually not get to the nice place. And then I said, let me pray the rosary. So for those who know about the rosary, truly who don't know about it, every bead just represents a prayer to say. But it is the Bible. It is the life of Jesus from the beginning, meditating on important points, you know, events of his life. When I started to pray this rosary, it truly gave me peace. I pray from morning at night. One rosary takes about 25 minutes. I pray 27 rosaries every day. It was the only time I can feel peace. Otherwise, me alone, without God in the prayer, I was not good for myself. The fear, the anger was too much. However, a part of this rosary started to challenge me. Our Lord is prayer, our common prayer. And I knew God now can look in my heart. And I didn't want to lie to him because he, I need him. If we lie to friends, we risk them, to lose them. I remember any time I went through this part. Forgive us our trespasses. Us, oh, we forgive those who trespass against us. Any time I reached that part, it was like a red flag. You are lying to God, and you don't mean it, and you know he can hear you. What am I going to do? Well, I had a better idea. Something said you can skip that part of the prayer. <laughs> and I skipped it, and guess what? I feel so much better. I wasn't lying to God anymore. I kept praying that way, I'm like, God, I, I got it now. I'm in good terms with God. I'm not lying to him. Anytime I reach about that part, I skipped it. Until one day, God is so patient with us. He waits for us. As long as we gather like this in his name, he sees the effort. As long as we pray, he starts to change you by just giving him a hand to start pulling you. So he knew what I was doing, of course. One day, I remember I was about to skip that part. It was as if somebody touched my shoulder and reminded me, hey, I hope you know our Lord's prayer is not man made. It's Jesus himself who gave those words. If I were you, I wouldn't try to edit his prayer. But oh, what do I do now? And what do you tell God? You, I just accepted him as my savior, as God. A God who doesn't lie. A God who doesn't make a mistake. 
So what do I tell him? For the first time in my life, I understood the meaning of surrendering. I went up to my knees, I put my hands up, and I begged God, if you know how to forgive, help me out. If he says so, it has to be so. As a human being, I make many mistakes many times, but you never make a mistake. So please help me. I feel so much better in another way, much better. I put back the prayer and I started to ask God when I reached that part, please help me. I don't know how. I'm not lying to you. I'm saying it out of obedience. But please help me to forgive. I kept praying that way until one day. Please be careful of what you pray for. <laughs> one day I was meditating on a part of the rosary when we think about Jesus dying on the cross. Oh, I was there. I felt like I was there. I saw his mother, oh, the pain of his mother, looking at his son, you know, agonizing and taking his last breath. I'm like, you know, my mom is not here. My pain is not as bad. He has nails in his body. Pinch yourself. It hurts. Imagine what it is to have nails in your body. And what amazed me was, why? Why did he do this? Because I felt like God was there. I felt like he was telling me, because I love you. I did it willingly because I care for you. And I went through that so that if you are ever not well loved, if you are ever rejected, if you are ever put to the cross as I was, which I felt in some way I was, learn from me. Remember, though I wasn't angry, I didn't say any bad word, and you, you have been pulled to the bad side now. You have become as evil because I wanted to kill them as they were killing us. And then I remember going through all that. It felt good that I felt it was out of love. He willingly gave his life. I'm a part of that. And when he said his last words, that truly shook me and broke my heart open. When he said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. It wasn't the first part, forgive them. By this time, I wanted to forgive. But how? It was when he said, they don't get it. I felt he was talking to me. People who are trying to hurt you, they don't even measure the consequences that will come to them. They don't know the pain they are causing you. You trying to be like them doesn't change anything. It actually adds up to the number of madness. Pray for them so that they can change their hearts. All of a sudden, I felt as if the world was divided in two parts. The part of love, where there are people like you, peaceful, even when you go through pain. A part of hate, like people like Hitler, like people who are causing the genocide. Sadly, like me, who was thinking about revenge. And I felt as if my Lord was asking me, where do you want to be? On the side of Mandela, Gandhi, you know, the saints, or the side of Mother Teresa, or on the side of hate with Hitler. I'm like, oh no, this is my people on this side. These are the people I love. And then I felt like I moved finally to the nice of love, of peace. And I realized that the people on the side of love are the people who have known suffering, who have known pain, but no matter what happens to them, they choose to defend justice, to defend love, to defend truth. A man like Mandela, he spent 27 years in prison, and he comes up and says, Let's talk about reconciliation. And those are the people I admired. I felt like a huge luggage was lifted from my shoulders. I felt free. I felt no need anymore to want to hurt people. I started to figure my life. What am I going to do? I felt like I was lifting from the ground in the bathroom. Like I just felt such a peace. I remember before I came out, actually, we ended up staying in that bathroom three months. We went in in April, we came out in July. Before I came out, I had a dream about our Lord. And he told me, my child, when you come out, you will find out everyone in your family had been killed. Those you left behind, because I still have a brother who was outside of the country. And then he said, however, if you continue to love me and to trust me, those two things, I will be there for you and I will do for you more than what your parents could have been able to do for you. 
And I remember telling him, if you can take care of me, who else do I need? And when I woke up, I told myself, no, you know, it's just a dream. I can say yes to that. But when I came out, I found out it was not just a dream. When I came out the very first day, I found out my family was killed. My mom, my dad, my two brothers, my grandma, my grandpa, my neighbors, my schoolmates, my best friend. A million people was killed in a period of three months. Everywhere was dead bodies. I remember crying. I threw my rosary on the side. I felt like prayer was almost too good to be true. It truly gave me a shield. Like I wasn't feeling the pain that I'm supposed to feel as I thought. I cried and cried. After a few minutes, I felt as if God was holding me tight. And he was reminding me, the journey of your loved ones is over here on earth and not in heaven. And your journey is still here. And you don't know how long it's going to be. It might be one more day, one more week, one year. I mean, we just saw what COVID did. 10 years, 20, 30, 50. But whatever that is, only God knows. You don't know. What is in your power is how you choose to use every moment you have. And if you choose love, I am with you. If you choose hatred, I'm not with you. If you choose kindness, I am with you. If you choose less, I'm not with you. I literally woke up from my tears and I started to look around in the refugee camp, trying to help somebody. Because when we die, we are going to come to give account to our Lord. And we are going to, to, to report what we have used our life to. And I told, I don't want to die crying, just grieving. I need to love somebody so I can have some good action in my hands to present to God. And I started to look around the refugee camp, helping somebody who was crying, someone who had a wound. Let me just ask them what, what they're feeling, how can I help? And you know, in times like that, you really have to be creative how to love people. But what I realized was, all of us, like me, every day, I'm presented with different capacity to love, to give myself. Some people are doctors, and they can use their strength to love somebody. Some people are judges, and they can begin to give truth and to justice to people. Some people are leaders in different ways, soldiers, mothers, fathers, daughters. You know, our job is to love. Every day I wake up, it truly is a surprise. I'm like, oh good, another chance to love somebody, another chance to do good, to create something like this. Let me gather friends so we can pray together because I know the power of the prayer. And that is all of us. To pray, to, to pray, but to love and use our life because no one among us has a guarantee how long life will be. We only have today. I moved to the United States when I met my husband in 1998, and I've been here 2006. I published my first book, which really surprised me, became a bestseller very quickly, and it allowed me to make a foundation to start speaking because this is the best thing that ever happened to me. To be able to share God's love, to be able to remind people it will end. Let's be happy. And let's reconcile when we still have time. Let's apologize when we still have a time. Let's love one another when we still have today, because we don't know what is tomorrow. I want to end here, but before I end, I just want to say this. You know, when I speak to a group, I know I'm speaking to a group, but truly, I'm speaking to individuals. Each one of us, we have our own challenges, our own obstacles, our own suffering. And I just want to say, from my heart to yours, whatever you might be facing, please remember, there is always hope with God. Don't give up. Hold on to prayer. And lastly, you know, I've gone to the prison. I met a man who kept my family. And when I saw him, it was the moment I realized what our Lord had said to me. They don't get it. Do you think anyone will want to be here? But when he was doing it, he didn't get to know what he was doing. He was blinded by hatred, blinded by selfishness, by anger, as we all do sometimes. Thankfully, I'm Catholic. Every two weeks I go to confession. No matter how much I try, 
I always fail to love somebody. I always fail to do something good. So when I met him, I offered him forgiveness. And I can still remember, he received it. It was as if he looked down, he couldn't look at me anymore. And he was much softer. And I just want to say, if I can forgive, anyone can forgive. Please pray for me. I will pray for you. May God bless you. And thank you so much for having me. Guys have been blessed this morning. Thank you, Immaculate. What an incredible, lived out story of prayer, strength, faith. Forgiveness is the key. Peace felt like freedom. God is real and He is almighty. Love is the engine. Be light for others. Eternity matters. These are just quick notes that I took that we were going through. We are grateful that each of you individuals have chosen to share this morning with us. Immaculate has graciously agreed to sign copies of her book immediately following the breakfast. That'll take place in the next room on your way out on the exit. There are also books, her books for purchase. Uh, Immaculate will sign a copy of the book or a program or uh, she's really gracious in that regard. So thank you very much. Now like Joshua following Moses, we have a response from our host, County Executive Steve Newhouse. Good luck, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Steve has been Orange County's executive since 2014, and uh, he's in the last year of his second term, and he's going to begin a third term in January 2022. Steve has competently and admirably led Orange County through the COVID pandemic. Well, of course, of course Steve has. Steve also serves as our country as a Lieutenant Commander in the Navy, Reserves, and perhaps, perhaps more importantly, Steve and his wife Rachel are the proud and busy parents of four young children. So COVID schmovid, four kids, yeah, you go. This is his sixth time hosting the Leadership Prayer Breakfast, which he was determined to see held and to continue to be held in Orange County. Please welcome Steve Newhouse. I, I know everybody in this room is praying for me because how do you follow her? I asked Immaculate before she was going up, I said, do you get nervous speaking? So she said, yes, please pray for me. So I hope you're praying for me. Uh, it's an honor to be here today as the county executive. We had, uh, before we do the prayer breakfast, we do a dinner the night before with all the speakers and the committee that does this. And it's really, you see this wonderful group of diverse people that are on the dais. But I'd like the people that are part of our committee, Mary, Pat, Dot, there's a number of you in the audience, please stand up, the people that meet at least once a month in my office to organize this. They're in the bathroom. Some of them don't even have a seat. They're standing in the back of the room. So thank you, ladies, thank you, God, for what you're doing. Um, you know, I was thinking about a couple of quick things. I read Immaculate's book a few weeks ago. And about 10 years ago, I just came back from Africa. And uh, I was there with, with the Marine Division. And uh, we were there during the Arab Spring to keep the Middle East, to try to keep a lid on it, on our allies. That was our job. And when I came back, a Pentagon spokesman gave an address to about 200 military officers, junior officers like me. And he said, when you get older and you have grandkids, we're going to have to explain to them why we did nothing during the Rwandan genocide in Africa, when we could have, the West. They also mentioned what happened, that was in the 90s. Her story is from the 90s. 
It's happened since in Sudan and other locations and continues to happen. So I put that in perspective. And that's what I wanted to talk about briefly, about perspective. A lot of people thank me uh, for what I've done as a county executive, but it's really this beautiful community we have here. We are blessed with what we have here. If we focus on looking at some of the negative things that you see in print or on TV, you will never see the gifts that we have every day from God. During the pandemic, we couldn't feed people across this country. Meals on wheels, jobs, everything went away. We depended on ordinary citizens, many of them of faith, to get us through this. And it's happened in Orange County. I'm thinking about the churches like Grace Community Church that lent hundreds of people a day to help us feed people that had no job, that had nowhere of getting things. We had people just recently, the Air National Guard is here. We saw what happened in Afghanistan a month ago. Just a complete tragedy. But there was really heroic actions that were going on there and it was done by the men and women over here. We, 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 we often forget and overlook the gifts that we are given every day. I call it a matter of perspective. We, you know, Larry talks about my children. I have faith because I have to have faith, not because I'm a believer, but I have to have faith for my kids' future, for my children's future. I see the joy and happiness and, and the strength that they have every day to go on. They don't even feel the impact that we do. One of the toughest things we have as men, more than women, and, and Immokalee and I were talking about this, we were talking about a woman's heart has the ability to forgive a lot easier than men. And as we were leading up to the prayer breakfast, I've talked to a lot of you that have read her book, and it's a powerful book. It's one of those, and I don't read a lot of books, I, I listen to them on, on uh, I say CD, Josh is making fun of me, but on Audible. But sometimes when you read a book, it's so powerful, you gotta close the book, and take a deep breath and say, wow. I had to like pull my car over because it was so powerful and, and um, the strength that she has to forgive people is very, uh, it, it seems that we don't have it in us, but we do. And if you really think about it, you really think about the, the, what we have in life and you think about what, what the Bible and what, what, what Jesus, she put it in perspective. It all comes down to one thing. If we want to continue to move forward, it's about forgiveness. And a lot of us, including me, have a tough time. I was in Iraq two years ago. I have a hard time forgiving people for what they've done, including people like ISIS. We were talking about that. I said, I didn't think there was anybody worse on this earth than ISIS until I read her book on Rwanda and how people could do such horrible things to each other. But if we're gonna move forward, we have to, we have to forgive. So that leads me to one last thing. I just wanna just quick say, when we pray, like everybody, most, most of this room, I think, prays on a regular basis. Whether it's in the morning or at night, if we go to bed, we pray for, and what do we do? We pray for our kids, we pray for our family, we pray for maybe a neighbor that's going through a tough time. How many times do we pray for people that we don't like, or we don't know, or people that are doing bad things? They may need those prayers just as much. And that's a lesson I've learned the hard way. And uh, I think we, we are really a blessed community, and we're blessed for one reason, we, we do this together. I see it every day, our law enforcement's here. One of my jobs as county executive is the main job is emergency management. Every day I see firefighters, police officers, EMTs doing extraordinary things. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And last year, the last 18 months of this chaos of the COVID world, we have countless examples of wonderful, wonderful, ordinary people doing extraordinary things, doing God's work. So continue to do that. Thank you for supporting this prayer breakfast. Uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful committee of people. We're already planning next year. I don't know how we're gonna top this. I'm not really, you live in New York City, so you're gonna be close by, but thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Steve.
he actually got notes from Immaculate on how to respond to Immaculate. <laughs> <laughs> Before we have our closing prayer, I remind you to please leave those completed cards on the table. And as mentioned, Immaculate will be signing books in the next room. In addition, if you enjoyed this morning and would, would like to donate to help future prayer breakfasts, we could really use the help. So please leave your contribution. There's a jug, there's a few jugs on the way out. We really appreciate that. We hope to see you virtually uh, uh, for the monthly prayer breakfast. So if you're interested in that, please mark that on the card. Uh, we really look forward to gathering again next year's for a face-to-face -face breakfast. We thank our hosts. We especially pause for a moment to thank all those who are serving us and made this delicious breakfast. Thank you. Now we'll have our closing prayer that will be followed by Grace Community Church's worship team leading us all in, in amazing grace. We are grateful this morning to have Mufetta Kruger with us to deliver our closing prayer. Mufetta is a follower of Christ. She's the wife of Troy Kruger, an aunt of many, of many nieces and nephews, and a children's ministry volunteer. In 2019, Mufetta responded to the Lord's call, and she went to the streets of Newburgh. Since then, Mufetta has founded In My Name Christian Ministry. She goes to Newburgh on a weekly basis and ministers to the homeless and the needy, providing food, clothing, prayer, and the Word of God. Mufetta is also an entrepreneur who, with her husband, operates Mufetta's Domestic Assistance, a housekeeping and household staffing agency. Thank you, Mufetta, for joining us. Good morning, everyone. This is truly an honor and a privilege to be here this morning with all of you. Immaculate, thank you for your powerful and amazing story and just faith, faith. And God is so, an amazing God. He is our strong tower. He's our refuge, he's our strength. And yes, pray without ceasing, it is so important. When we don't know how to pray, the Spirit prays for us. When we don't know what to do, all we need to do is go to God and pray because He is so faithful to help us. And yes, love and forgiveness. If we don't have that, we don't have anything because we just bear that burden that will not help us. So, to all of you today, I just want you to know, love your enemies, just love. It's what brings us through, even the season that we just went through. It was a difficult season, but because of love, hope, and faith, really, the, the spirit, the, the fruit of the spirit brought us through and brought many of you here today because God's grace and mercy brought us through the season that we just went through. It brought Immaculate out of what she was in, God's grace and mercy, that she was able to come here today, share her story. So I just want everyone to just stand and let's give God thanks for this wonderful day. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you have brought us here. You have gathered us here on this precious day. Lord, we know there were some who wanted to be here but weren't able to. So Lord, today we surrender ourselves to you. We surrender our will. We surrender our ways. And we ask you, O oh Lord, that you will take over. Lord, I ask for your blessing on everyone who came today and the speakers, the committee who've put this together. Lord, I thank you for the wisdom, the strength that you gave to them to put this wonderful event together. I thank you, Lord, for all the leaders, the believers, everyone that are here today, Lord. 
I pray that you will bless them beyond measure today, Lord. And I pray today that they will put their trust in you, put their faith in you, and Lord, they will know that you are the God of all gods. You're the King of all kings. And Lord Jesus, when we trust you, you will do anything for us. So I pray for all who are here today who came in feeling weak, feeling low, feeling as if things are coming to an end. I say to you, press in to God. Press in and ask him to come in. For those of you who have a hard heart today and forgiveness is nowhere near, I ask that you will say to God, help me to forgive those who have trespassed against me because you will be free and that love will enter in. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you. And I pray that as these leaders, Lord, walk out of here, whether it's going back to the office or going back home or wherever they are going, I pray that you will surround them with your strength this day. Lord, help us to live a life that is pleasing unto you. Help us, Lord, to see each other through your eyes and not with hate, but with love and with hope. Bless us this day. Give us the strength to now go out into the world. And we praise you and we honor you and we turn the rest of this day over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mufetta, for closing us in such a beautiful prayer. And you should have heard Amazing Grace from up here. It was amazing. I thank you all for attending this morning, and I look forward to seeing each of you wearing bow ties next year. Thank you. God bless you all. <laughs>